Jesus. This is the inspired, inerrant, holy scriptures, and it leads to human flourishing. Amen? Hey, grab your Bibles, fire them up. We're going to be in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter. Um, this is kind of a special day, as I mentioned, but we don't get to gather as uh, an entire Fellowship Church family with all of our friends here, except for once a year, all in one service in one place. So pretty special day, but we're going to wrap this up. We're going to do it quickly here. We want to beat the heat. I can smell the food trucks cooking up there. And I don't know about you, but uh, when I say amen, I'm going to run off this stage and beat you up there. Amen? So here's the thing, my friends. We want to we jump into this. We're going to wrap up our, our Great Commandment series. I thought, really, what a wonderful way to wrap the whole thing up, this whole Great Commandment series, and just do it right here at Fellowship Fest 2022. The Great Commandment, you have a young theologian. The Bible calls him a lawyer, and this lawyer comes to the Lord and says, okay, Jesus, so what, what is the, the best thing that I can glean from the Scriptures? All of these commandments, 613 of them, what, what is the best thing that I can glean uh, from the Scriptures here? And well... Uh, comes out, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. It really is that simple. I mean, see, didn't that sound just like him when I, he did it a while ago? Sort of. So what we're doing is we gather on the Lord's Day every, every week. Every week we gather here to not forsake the fellowshipping of the, and the assembling of the brothers and sisters to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable, to live out the truths of Scripture. And so what we need to understand here as we put this into practice, that love is not an emotion, it's it's an action we take. If you want to follow along, you want to fire up the app, the notes are in the app, the Fellowship Church app, if you want to follow along there. But my friends, we got to understand something about the Bible as it teaches about love. Love is an action, it's proactive, it's not a a feeling in the way we normally think of it. I feel in love, it's an action. I mean, this is why we do what we do, because God uh, of the universe, he looked down upon us, he saw our greatest need, we needed a savior, we needed to be saved from our sins, and because of his immense love and and grace and mercy, he sent his one and only son into this earth to be born miraculously, he lived a sinless life, and he went to the cross, and he demonstrates his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. I mean, that is the ultimate gift of service, isn't it? The ultimate gift of of love, and this is who we are. We want to be conduit Christians. We let God's love just flow through us, so we can love our neighbors. Not a cul-de-sac Christian. We we keep all His goodness and His love to ourselves, and so this is why we, as a church, serve the way we do. In many ways, today is a celebration of our last uh, couple of weeks of Live to Bless. We've had dozens and dozens of projects, uh, hundreds of volunteers out serving the community. What we've been doing is demonstrating the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hopefully, some would see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven, so then we could declare the gospel that Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. This is why we do what we do. It's all because of him and who he is and what he's done. We, We do these things to demonstrate the gospel. I mean, think about it. Jesus was love in action, wasn't he? I mean, he came to take away the sins of the world. That's the gospel, and we demonstrate that as believers in many different ways. So we show that God has loved us by loving other people. As God served us, we, we serve other people. And so for those of us that are born again, Bible-believing Christians who are, who are filled and empowered well, and compelled by the Holy Spirit of God, this is simply what we do. We live for the good of others. Every day you have opportunities. Every day we have opportunities. Next week, uh, we're going at, at, to as a church, do what we always do. We're going to uh, write out and collect hundreds and hundreds of prayer cards and distribute those out with gift cards to our, our school teachers at, at our local schools that are our partner ministries. Because it's what we do. Why, why do we do this? You know, why, why are we always serving and spending time and energy and money on people outside? Like, what about, what about us inside the church? Well, we could do both, can't we? We could do both. But this is why we live to bless. So here's the motive. The God of heaven, you're looking at notes there. The God of heaven took off his royal robes. He left heaven. He came to earth to rescue us from our sins. Therefore, we go and demonstrate what he's done for us. We simply put his attributes on advertisement. That's who you are as a Christian. You are advertising the good Lord's attributes by how you live and how you talk and how you bless. 
And that's what this series has been all about. It's been about loving our neighbors, even loving our enemies. Remember last week, loving our enemies. It's serving as a light in the community. And so how do we do that? Well, so today, today is super, super, super practical. And really, it's a perfect day uh, for us to look at this passage as we celebrate that Jesus has saved us and he's using us in our families, in our church, in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our region. I mean, think about this, friends. In a polarized world, in a divisive world, Jesus has teed up the church to be the church. Amen? I mean, you look around at what's happening, and the church has been set up perfectly by the Lord to, to lean into the scriptures and live them out. And so today, we simply gather to remind ourselves of the mission through our, our prayers and uh, through the, the lyrics of the songs, through the testimonies of those that were being baptized. He has set up the church to glorify him in an amazing and distinct way in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, in, in your region. I mean, he has set us up to love him and love our neighbors, to demonstrate the gospel by leaning into the, the good deeds that he has prepared for us since the foundation of the world. So 1 Peter, uh, go to 1 Peter, flip over there, grab it, fire it up, however you're going to get to it. So Peter was written by, anyone know? Peter. Got a few guys that went to Sunday school, excellent. So Peter, now Peter was our kind of guy. He was, uh, he was a guy that we could really understand. He was a guy that we get. He can, we can relate to him. Peter was always talking, sometimes putting his foot in his mouth, wasn't he? And he's just a guy that we can relate to, a regular everyday guy. I mean, I think of, of Paul sometimes, and I think of, of Romans. I mean, Romans is written way up here, and sometimes I'm like, wow, I, Paul, I just don't quite relate to you. It's hard for me to understand who you are. And so Paul, he's all like, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I studied under Gamaliel, the, the greatest of the institutions. And Peter's more like, you know, I know the difference between a crick and a creek, and I drive a Chevy F-150 uh, or a Dodge pickup. He's just a regular guy. He's like us. He just drives a, a regular car. That's why I love Peter. He's, uh, he comes along here in, in this epistle, and he's writing to some new Christians who are going through some difficult times. And he starts the letter off by saying, okay, you're exiles, new believers. I know you got some trouble going on, but you're, you're exiles. This is not your home. Heaven is your permanent home. But today, I want you to understand something. You've been saved. You've been sanctified. You've been set apart to serve people. Now, let's look at the word. If you'd like, would you stand with me in honor of reading the word of God? Can we stand to honor the scriptures? We're going to be in 1 Peter 4. If you're able, please stand. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, Father, bless the reading of your word. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Illuminate it to us. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, let's clear something up here. Uh, some of you look at that passage, and it kicks off the end of all things. You say, that's all you Christians, uh, you know, you think about it. You think about the end, end of times. I mean, even Peter thought Jesus was going to return at any moment. So let me clarify something here. When he talks about the end of all things, what he, what he means there is it's, it's the next thing in line. It's the idea it's the next thing on the calendar. It doesn't have to be immediate. It's just going to be the next big thing on the prophetic calendar of our sovereign God. So let me give you the Bible's timeline. It's in your notes if you're following along there. But you have the Abrahamic promise. That's essentially Genesis. Uh, th this is the promise, Abrahamic promise. Then you have the Mosaic covenant. It's Acts, uh, Acts, uh, uh, you know, uh, Act 2, you could say. Then you have the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the first act, the second act, all point to the work and person of Jesus Christ. But he's Act 3. Then you have the church age, 
Act 4, the Spirit has come and created His church. We're living in the church age now. So the next thing on the prophetic calendar is the return of Christ. And, and so if you look at this passage now in light of that, the end of all things is near. What does it mean to be near? The end of all things is next. That's all Peter is saying here. In light of this, Christians, being the next thing on the prophetic calendar, the next act in God's story, Peter says, well, act like it. Act like it. He goes, I'm calling you, you new believers there that he's writing to to begin to act like the next big thing on God's prophetic calendar is to be his return. The sum total of your life, 70, 80, 90 years on this earth, is not everything. More is coming. Eternity is coming. This is but a, a blip on the timeline of, of your existence. You are eternal, and you will live somewhere forever. Whether it's in heaven because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ or because of your rebellion, it will be in a real place called hell. But my friends, this life is simply a blip on the radar. Now look at it. Because of this truth, what does it say? Because of this truth, then be of sound judgment. Be self-controlled and sober-minded. What's the opposite of that? To be emotionally driven and unstable. You know, we live in a culture that is emotionally driven and unstable. And as born-again believers who have the Spirit of God, we are to live our lives differently. He says in light of this next big act coming, we should be of sound judgment and sober spirit. And then he gets into the meat of the topic, verse 8. Look at it there. Look at it, verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. So Peter is saying, keep loving one another. This means there was probably some issues with the brothers and sisters loving one another. You know, sometimes we romanticize the early church, don't we? We like to think back to the early church. They had it all going. They knew what they were doing. Obviously, there was some infighting taking place. I mean, we, we know some pretty crazy things were taking place in the, in the church. If you read Corinthians and you read the rest of the New Testament. And so he's saying, you need to keep loving one another. You need to work at this. He says, love earnestly. Do you see it? Look at it. Look at it there. Above all, keep fervent or earnest in your love for one another. That means it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some work. We're going to have to strain to, to actively love our neighbor. Now, why in the world would we do this? Because it says right here, love covers a multitude of sins. It, it doesn't erase the sins, but it, it covers it like, like someone covering your tab. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you, you, uh, you order your food, and at the end, someone comes by and says, hey, someone anonymously covered your tab. And you just get to get up and walk out like you own the place. It's a wonderful feeling. This is what love does. As you and I love one another, as we love our brothers and sisters, as we love our neighbors, as we love our enemies, it covers a multitude of sins, and it begins to change how we see one another and how we interact with one another. It doesn't erase those sins, but it covers it. Here's what he's saying. If you're in your notes, look at it. If your Bible study, your church activity, your ministry doesn't help you love people more, you're doing it wrong. That's what he's saying. If your religion doesn't uh, compel you to love people more, you're doing it wrong. This is the good news of Christianity. It's not religion. It's not a set of rules. This is about grace, getting something great we don't deserve. He, he comes and just erases our sins and puts them under the blood of Christ. And when you have been forgiven like that and, and you see yourself as a recipient of his grace, you can't help but be a vessel of his grace. That's the, what he's getting after here. Again, Peter's letting us know it's not easy to love others. Not in this manner anyway. I mean, some people are really difficult to love, right? Can I get an amen? I mean, some people are downright hard to love. I mean, they are like jabroni times two, and they're just hard to like, let alone love, amen? And so he comes along and says, remember, Christian, love is not an emotion, it's a choice. Love is not an emotion, it's a choice. You and I make a choice every day if we're going to be a conduit Christian, allowing his grace and love and mercy to flow through us to others, or we're going to be a cul-de-sac Christian and keep it to ourselves. And cul-de-sac Christians eventually sour and become Pharisees. We don't want to be that. 
we can do this. Why? Because God loved us. It's the gospel at work in our lives. I mean, theologically, we were set up as his enemy. Yet he demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet his enemy, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So we must let his love flow through us to others. He actually says this is what makes you unique amongst all the people on the earth. This is what makes believers stand out is the way they, they love others. Anyone can love people they like. But believers are to love the hard people. I mean, it's easy to love the nice, compliant, sweet coworker or neighbor or friend or family member. I mean, who doesn't love them? They're just wonderful. But it's tough to love, well, the, the hard person. So think about the person maybe in your neighborhood, somebody in your workplace who's ill-mannered, who's rude, who's selfish, who's irritable. And if you can't think of that person, it might just be you. But the gospel applied will change your heart as well. But think of that person. Peter says, that's it. That's the person I want you to love. That's the person I want my love to flow through you to. That's the person right there. Now, verse 9, how do we do it? Look at it, verse 9. How do we do it? Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Be hospitable. Now, hospitality, biblical gospel hospitality, is not Martha Stewart and scented candles and wonderfully made doilies. It's just not that. It could be that. That's a, a great resource or a tool. But biblical hospitality, if you recall from a few weeks ago, is he takes the word for love and the word for stranger and he squishes them together. And biblical hospitality is love of stranger. This is why earlier today I said, hey, if you are visiting with us, if you're a guest with us today, we're glad you're here. All we would uh, want for you is to encounter the Lord, to meet some new friends. And we want to give you a gift. We want to show you, demonstrate the gospel by giving you a gift, by demonstrating gospel hospitality. It's the, it's the love of, of stranger here. That's what it is. And so that's what it is, he says. So here's the thing. As we go about that, what does that look like, this gospel hospitality? Oh, my friends, here's what it looks like. It's, it's you befriending someone that you don't know. You know what happens here? It actually happened this very morning. Did you know that? So this very morning, twice, two times this morning as people were gathering here, I, I walk up to a, a, an individual and they begin talking to me and they introduce me to another individual. They say, hey, I don't know if you've met so-and-so yet, but this is so-and-so. And then as I'm leaving, I go, well, how long have you guys known each other? They said, we don't. We just sit down next to one another. You, you see, that's gospel hospitality. I mean, the way they were so warm and friendly and kind and welcoming to one another, I thought, well, surely, surely these, these individuals were friends and they came together. And so right there, it was so prevalent to see the gospel at work. And so, my friends, when you come to church, you know, we don't save seats for friends. We, we save seats for those we don't know yet. We introduce them to our, to our circle. We introduce them to those that we know and that we, we care about. All right, so... Let's continue here. What does it look like? Let's continue. And then he goes on here as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so every one of us has been given a gift. And he says we need to use that gift, exercise that gift in loving one another. Let me give you just a quick little illustration. Can I just make a, a quick little detour here over, over into the Gospels, if I could? And, and so let's just go to the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark, Mark 14. And I want to make a quick detour. And, and so what's happening is Jesus now is at the Last Supper. This is the Passover. They're celebrating the Passover meal. This is really the great motivation behind why we love our neighbors. This is the great motivation right here. They're about to celebrate the Passover. The, the disciples are all together. They, they've eaten their meal and understand what's happening. Jesus looks over and Peter's about to deny him, right? And he knows it. Judas Iscariot is about to betray him and he knows it. And then this is what I find interesting. This is what I find just uh, amazingly interesting. After the meal's over, the Lord knowing all of this, it says the Lord stood. Now the Lord stood. Now uh, it just had mentioned here that he had been giving all authority under heaven and earth. 
Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, I know that someone's about to betray me. Someone's about to deny me, and I've been given all authority. I'm the boss. I'm going to stand up and say, okay, Judas, what, what in my name are you about to do? Okay, Peter, well, what are you about to do? Let me just call you on the carpet. But that's not how the Lord acts because he's graceful and merciful. So here's what he does. He gets up in the scriptures, say he ties a, a towel around his waist. Look at this, my friends. The scriptures has just, have just mentioned he has been given all authority and glory and honor, and he stands to serve the disciples. Now, culturally, you've got to understand what's happening here. Now, they didn't have shoes like we had back in the day. And, well, uh, they had animals, and it wasn't like going over here to Lee McKeegan Park and, you know, you, you walk behind your little dog with a green bag and you scoop their poop, right? It's not quite that clean. You got donkeys in the streets doing what donkeys do, okay? And now you're walking around in your sandals, and you got dirt and other things mixing on your toes, and you come into a room like the, the Last Supper, and they begin to lay out. Now, the way they would eat is they would recline with their, their, their face to the table and their feet out. And you would really have the next person's head close to your feet. So, I mean, you can just imagine Peter over here. He's like, dude, dude, uh, Judas, I'm trying to eat some hummus, and your feet stink. And so this is why culture, when you go into a home, the, the lowest of the low of servants would clean their feet, would prepare their feet. Now, on this occasion, Jesus has just been given all authority under heaven. He knows he's about to be betrayed by Judas. He knows Peter will deny him. But get this, my friends. We, we have a misunderstanding of the, the Judas relationship. Jesus did not hate Judas. Jesus loved Judas. Actually, in the story, you and I are Judas. How often... Do we sell the Lord out for less than a few pieces of silver? We sell the Lord out for a few likes on social media. We sell the Lord out, we sell the Lord out to, to get ahead at work. We sell the Lord out to, to, to be a little more popular, to get the date that we want. I mean, we're the Judas. And yet the Lord loves Judas. Now, I'm not saying go name your next baby child Judas Iscariot. In all of my days of... Uh, doing baby dedications. We've never dedicated a little Judas Iscariot. But mind you, he loved Judas. And so he arises from the, from the table and he begins to clean their feet. You know it's a lowly, lowly thing because did you pick up on this? I never noticed it before until this week. Not one disciple said, oh Lord, let me help you with that. Have you ever noticed sometimes, you know, you're at work and your boss maybe starts taking the table and cleaning it off or, or, or doing some things and you run up, hey, let me do that for you real quick. They didn't do that for Jesus because this was a lowly, lowly thing to clean the feet of the men. My friends, this is why we serve others. This is why we love others because Jesus is the ultimate example. He served us by coming and taking sin upon his back, my sin, your sins, so we could be forgiven and have eternal life. This is the motivation. Jesus is the motivation to love others. He's the motivation. All right, let's keep going here. Look at it one more time. Back in Mark, or back in Peter, Peter 4. Let's wrap this thing up here. Peter 4. As each one of you has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Everybody, when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, gets a spiritual gift. You say, well, what is it? I don't know what your gift is, but you can discover it. You know, we have a, a whole adult growth steps that we would love to walk with you if you so desire uh, to help you discover how God has shaped you and created you and made you. You know what I know? The average Christian in America is bored in their faith, and you're just going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. You're, you're bored. You, you come to church. You listen to a message. You sing the songs, and you go right back out. And you live your life and you come back next week for a little more and you think there's got to be more to my Christian life than this. There's got to be more to my faith walk than this. Where is that vibrant, abundant life, that Jesus quality of life? I think the problem is right here when it comes to serving others and using your gifts. Most of us are so busy serving ourselves, we never have time to serve others and actually lean into the very purpose God saved us and sanctified us and called us. That is to serve others for their good and his glory. So friends, this is why 
This is why so many of us are just kind of going through the motions. Is that you today? Is the Holy Spirit really leaning into you? And you're saying, man, that's me. And can I just be honest for us dudes? Most men in the church are bored. And that shouldn't be the case. When you lean into your purpose and you begin to serve others for their good and his glory, man, there is something exhilarating and wonderful and life-giving because now finally you're using your body, your heart, your soul, your mind, your life for what it was intended for. It was never intended to simply bring satisfaction and joy to you and to you alone. It leaves you hollow. It leaves you broken. It leaves you empty. If you're here this morning or you're watching via live stream, we would love to walk with you and help you discover that purpose. Simply uh, let us know. Let one of the staff members know. One of the ones in the maroon shirts. We will get you hooked up with our growth steps. But let's continue. Verse 11, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies. So that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom, whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever and ever. So here's the deal. When you speak, this isn't just preachers here. It's just when you speak as a Christian, you speak to build others up. You speak truth and love. When you serve, meaning you will be serving sometime, somewhere, you serve for their good and his glory. My friends, when you get these two components of your Christian faith down, you speak up for him and you serve out for him, life begins to get really exciting. And guess what? You don't have to change your location or your vocation to speak up and serve out. It's awesome. So let's make this really practical here, okay? Can we make it really practical? Really practical. Let's just do this. How, how can I go about serving? So let's just real quickly, number one, you can serve at home. You can serve at home. Really, the best place to start living out your faith is in, at home, in front of your family. So for those of you that maybe you, you got a roommate or you're married, you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve my, my roommate or my spouse by doing the chore they hate the most. Okay, so I've been trying to think of the chore that, that Kate hates the most. And uh, there's a couple of them. But I was thinking taking out the trash, cleaning toilets. So uh, I've decided I'm going to be the, the, uh, the pro toilet cleaner in our house. Uh, you ask her next week, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, okay, at least for the week, okay? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a bunch of bleach in there, get some chemicals. I'm going to spray that bad boy down. It's going to be good. But what, what chore could you do for your spouse to serve them for their good and his glory? I mean, what a way to, to grow in sanctification. Did you know this, that one of the, the greatest ways we grow spiritually is when we serve others? Some of, some of us are stuck in our growth because we haven't served anyone for a long, long time. You see, serving others humbles us. It humbles us and allows us to grow spiritually. How else can you serve? Well, you can serve at home. You can serve at work. Think of that annoying individual that we talked about earlier. How can you serve them? And don't serve them to get them, you know, fired from their job. That's not what I'm talking about. How can you serve them? How can you come alongside of them and minister to them and care for them? How about in your community? What can you do to be a value add in your community? School's about to start. Could you volunteer in a, in a classroom? Can you volunteer, uh, you know, in, uh, at, a, at a community group? One of our ministry partners, Resource Health or Shiloh Center or Restoration Health or, uh, or the Children's Home or, or you name it. So many opportunities to serve and be a value add in our own community. Can you imagine taking an hour or two a week where we're not just about serving ourselves and satisfying our desires and wants and we're actually serving others, the Lord will use that in your sanctification process. You can serve in the church. You can serve within the local church. Lots of opportunities to serve within the local church. And there's so many ministries. Everybody should have a primary ministry and a secondary ministry. Everybody should have a ministry that just gets you out of bed. This is what you were made for. This is what you are created for. This is what you were saved for. This is what you've been sanctified for. This is what you do. And then we have secondary ministries, you know, things that's just got to be done in the family. You know, somebody's got somebody's to take the, the, the trash out. Somebody's got to, you know, vacuum the, the carpets, right? Somebody's got to do these things. And, well, you do that on occasion. You don't want to do it every week, but you do it on occasion. We should all be serving in our local church on occasion somewhere, and we should be serving all the time in our primary ministry, at church, at home, at work, in the neighborhoods. So here's what I know. 
there's a whole bunch of people perhaps that are watching this via the live stream or perhaps even in this room that you are much like me. 20 years ago, I was floundering at life and faith. I knew there had to be more to my Christian faith than what I was experiencing. And it wasn't until I began to be discipled and to understand that it is about loving God and being a conduit to love others by serving them that I really began to live. Life hasn't been perfect. Lots of ups and downs. But my friends, it has been exhilarating. It has been exciting. It has been fruitful. It has been fulfilling. That's the kind of life the Lord has for you as well. And, and so I thought, how, how are we going to end this? How are we going to end this? So here's what I would like to do. Is one, would you just bow with me for just a moment? And first, I just want to share, first off, for those of you that are, are here and you've yet to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I Man, I just want you to hear loud and clear that God loves you. That he loves you. He loves you so much, in fact, that he sent his one and only son to this earth to die on a cross, to shed his blood. He died, rose again, and three days later he proved he is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. And the Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life and forgive you of your sins. I'd love to leave you in a quick prayer. Could I do that just all across this place? Just, just freeze for just a moment. Just bow your head and close your eyes. You say, Pastor, that's what I want to do. I'm ready to ask Jesus to come into my life, forgive me my sins, be my Savior. I want to begin to live a life that is for the good of others and for his glory, but I'm not sure how to do that. Well, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you can begin a relationship with him right now. Here's what you do. Right now, all across this place, all across the live stream, wherever you're watching in from, you pray a prayer like this. You say, Dear Jesus, I believe. I believe you are who you say you are and can do what you say you can do. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead to take away my sins. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me and save me. Help me to live on purpose and for great purpose in Jesus' name. Just keep bowed with me for just a moment. If that, if that was you, if that was you, I don't want to pray for you. We want to give you some resources and tools. At these tents, as we exit here, there's going to be uh, some little uh, kits with Bibles and some uh, 101 Discipleship Helps. I want to give those to you. We'd love to talk with you after the service here just a little bit. The staff will be around. Find someone in one of the maroon shirts. As I was thinking about it for all of us today, I, I wanted to write a prayer that we would say together. I think it's going to be on the screen. And so if you just look up and with a posture of prayer all across this room, if you say, Jesus, I want to be a conduit Christian. I want to let your love flow through me to others. I want to be a value add in my family, in my neighborhood, in my community, in my workplace, in my church. I want to begin to live life according to your word. I want to, to flourish. I, I no longer want to flounder. Let's pray this prayer together. It's right there on the screen. All together, let's with gusto, let's say it together. Dear Jesus... Let's go all together. Let's say, dear Jesus, I'm so grateful for the way you have loved me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me of my narcissistic tendencies, my consumer mindset. Right now, Jesus, soften my heart to serve my family, my friends, in neighborhood with joy and thankfulness. Empower me to do this for the good of others and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I want to do. Let's stand. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. Let's worship a God who left the royal robes of heaven and came on a rescue mission to save us from our sins and to give us a Jesus quality of life today and eternity with him forever. Amen? You know, the staff is going to be down front. If you need prayer, you have questions about what you've heard, you would simply enjoy to be prayed over, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to come and let us pray over you. I've had a couple say, that, hey, I'm just dealing with some sickness. Well, then come and let us pray for you. You simply are having some relational uh, hardships. 
He said, I'd love to have someone pray over this relationship that it can be restored. Come and let us pray. Maybe you prayed that prayer to ask the Lord Jesus to come into your life and to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior. Then come. We'll be right here. Let's worship the King. If you need prayer, you have questions, the team will be right here. Go ahead, guys.